competency. Uh, good news is that uh, it's not only the, the, the last competency in the, uh, in the course, it's also probably the shortest competency. It's only, it's only about 30 pages long. Uh, that's the good news. Bad news is there's a lot of CDFM questions that they pull from this competency. So uh, I'll try to cover it, everything I know about and then some and uh, point you to the areas that you need to focus on. So let's look at this. Okay, our learning objectives here. Uh, we're gonna talk about the legal requirements for a successful audit. Uh, we've talked about that already. Uh, back in 1990, uh, Congress signed that law called the Chief Financial Officers Act. Uh, prior to that law being signed, uh, there's, a, there's an organization, I think Rich touched on this, if you're a certified public accountant, there's an organization called the American Institute of CPAs, okay? AICPA, it's the acronym. And it's, it's a pretty large organization. It's been around since 1880 or thereabouts, about 450,000 members. Anyway, they were asked to look at um, how we do accounting and financial management and things like that in the federal government. So they went out and they, they looked at a bunch of organizations and they came back with some recommendations. And their number one recommendation, uh, which is why we, the law is named this, is that uh, we've looked at all these agencies and there's no one designated as the chief financial officer for that agency. Uh, hence the name CFO Act. And that was one of the requirements to, step to uh, have someone serve as the chief financial officer. Uh, some of the other recommendations were that uh, there was no gap for the federal government. Uh, prior to, um, you know, the gap that, we, that Rich just covered, we used uh, commercial accounting standards. Well, you know, uh, to try to do, put together our financial reports. Well, you know, how many companies own battleships and rockets and atomic bombs and the Grand Canyon and things like that, you know, some of the stuff we own in the government. And so uh, we needed our own generally accepted accounting principles. So that was another one of those things that came out of there. And then uh, they also said, you know, in the private sector, our financial statements have to be audited. Why don't yours? And uh, that's kind of the genesis of having the requirement for clean financial, auditable financial statements. <clears throat> so when that law was signed, uh, it required government agencies that uh, were at what they call business activities to submit auditable financial statements. Well, business activities are things like working capital funds. You know, I went over that the other day, or working capital funds in DOD. Uh, the post office was considered a business activity. It operates as a business. You go there, you give them five bucks, they give you some stamps. Okay, so it was uh, geared towards business activities only. And it wasn't until 1994, Congress passed that other law called GIMRA, the Government Management Reform Act. And that required all 24 CFO agencies to have auditable financial statements. Okay, you want to make sure you know that for testing purposes, the 1994 Government Management Reform Act. And so we've had this requirement to get audible financial statements since uh, 94, and what is it, 2020? We're not there yet. Um, so the approach that DOD took to uh, go down this path as they set up this group called the FIRE. And it used to be called Financial Improvement and Audit Readiness. A couple of years ago, the name was changed and now it's just audit remediation. So if you ever look at the, the audit reports, we've been audited now a couple of years. Um, all basically what we're trying to do is uh, remediate some of the findings that have come out of our audits. And they call these things, whenever there's a finding, they call it, it they, they refer to it as an NFR, a notification of findings and recommendations. And I think we had something like, in our initial audit, something like 3,500 findings. 
And, you know, we've mentioned, the Rich mentioned, the, something like 28 or so material weaknesses. Uh, so we're far from having a clean audit opinion. And even when we clear up a material weakness, we may clear it and take drop it off the list. Uh, an, another one gets brought up and we, we add a new one to it. One of the latest ones I've seen was the F-35 is now, the F-35 program, the Joint Strike Fighter, is one of our material weaknesses. Um, I was looking at the audit on that. The auditors found that there was 3 million pieces of equipment that, that was on the books that they couldn't account for, okay, totaling something like $2 billion. So, you know, drop one off, we add one on. But uh, that's the goal, though. We keep working toward the goal. Uh, the bullet on the chart, Gagas. We're going to be talking about that, generally accepted government auditing standards. Uh, GAGUS is probably one of the worst acronyms uh, that come up with. Uh, this is what often is called the yellow book. This is a auditing standards that are published by GAO. So this week, we talked about the three books. Green book I talked about on internal controls. Red book, Rich talked about on uh, appropriation law. And now you have the yellow book, and it's called GAGAS, General Accepted Government Auditing Standards. You know, we need auditing standards because if they're gonna be doing audits, we would like consistency. Again, consistency in our audits. I'm gonna be audited. I wanna be audited the same way everybody else gets looked at. Uh, we'll be looking at different types of audits. Uh, we have three main types, financial audits, performance audits, and what they call attestation agreements, arrangements. Okay. So we'll look at those and what makes up those different, different type, types of things. And then we'll look at a couple of the audit groups uh, in DOD. We're going to discuss the three phases of an audit. And this is where you're going to get a lot of questions, what takes place in each phase. And we'll look at the audit report. So we talked about fire. Um, fire has probably been around now at, at least 15 years. This is a group in, in, the, in the Pentagon. And it was the strategy, it was the approach um, that DOD decided to take when they started getting serious about trying to get a clean audit opinion. We, they, they didn't really get serious for the first 20 or more years. Um, but uh, they kept getting beat up by Congress. You know, we talked about, um, how big a budget we have. And when you look at that size of DOD budget in comparison to uh, the whole, all the monies that the federal government spends, we're a pretty good wedge. We're a pretty good slice of that. And uh, also mentioned, you know, the GAO is required to audit the financial statements of the federal government and report that their uh, findings to Congress. And they do this and they do it every year. And every year it's the same story. They come out and say, we cannot render an opinion because of that big wedge, which is DOD, that is unauditable. Okay. Makes it kind of easy on them. They can't, they can't render an opinion because of uh, uh, our lack of getting a clean audit opinion. So every year DOD gets called into Congress to ask why we can't get a clean audit opinion. Um, so this was the strategy that FIRE adopted when they were going to, in their approach to get full financial uh, complete audit and audit statement. Anyway, uh, they were going to do this in waves. And the first three waves were going to kind of run concurrently. Uh, the first wave, you know, get our audit, the appropriations that received. I think we actually accomplished that. Uh, the second wave, uh, I remember this. Leon Panetta was the Secretary of Defense, and he was Secretary of Defense under President Obama. So around uh, 20, the year 2012, he was up there in front of Congress with this, you know, with the DoD Comptroller, and uh, basically he made a statement. He goes, uh, "I know, you know, I know we're not audible yet." He goes, "But by the end of fiscal year 2014." We weren't, we're not going to have everything auditable, but we will have the statement of budgetary resources auditable. That's one of those four, one of the four key statements that Rich just covered. Okay. Uh, so he said that around 2012. 
Uh, I think he retired in 2013, and then come in the 2014, uh, Chuck Hagel was the Secretary of Defense, and uh, that that statement never did get uh, a clean opinion. And uh, Chuck Hagel goes, "Well, uh, I was I didn't make that statement." He, so he got testified. He had to testify in front of Congress. And he goes, I know we missed it, uh, but let me tell you, by the end of 2017, we're not only going to have a statement of budgetary resources audible, we're going to have all those other three key financial statements audible. He said that in 2014. Uh, then he, about a year later, he retired. <laughs> General Mattis, uh, Mad Dog Mattis, he was the Secretary of Defense in 2017. He got called in front of Congress. He goes, I don't know when we're going to get these things audible. Okay, at least he was honest. Okay, but that's been the goal. Um, and so we keep pushing toward that goal, trying to clean up our, uh, correct our notifications and findings, those types of things. Along with these, um, you know, th this these waves, there were two priorities that were supposed to come out of this. Uh, to improve budgetary information, which was wave two, you know, so we have better budgetary information. And also then um, to, to improve our mission critical asset information. We talked about asset, does it exist? And is it complete? You know, do we have good records of everything uh, that we own and uh, are they available? Existence and completeness. And uh, we own so much, it's, we're, we're not there yet. We're not yet there yet. But that was the approach, okay? Okay, so a little bit about auditing, auditing overview. You know, they always say the two biggest lies in the federal government, uh, you'll hear someone knocking at the door and they'll say, I'm an auditor and I'm here to help. That's the first lie. And then you, you greet the auditor and you say, hey, I'm glad to see you. That's the second lie. Two biggest lies in the government. Okay. So auditing. Um, it always amazed me. I used, you know, when they remember when they used to have, and they don't have too much anymore. They used to have all these beauty pageants on TV. You know, Miss America, Miss Universe, whatever. Um, they start out with you know 50 contestants, and they whittle it down to five, the five finalists. And uh, so you have five finalists, and then they introduce six judges or so that's judging, going to pick the winner. And right before they uh, get into asking the five finalist questions, they always would bring out someone from one of the big five accounting firms. You know, they're bringing someone in from Price Waterhouse, or they bring some, you know, group of guys in from uh, Deloitte or KPMG, you know, the big accounting firms. And it always amazed me that you hire these multi-million dollar firms to count six votes for five women, okay? Why, why am I paying multi, you know, I'm hiring a multi-million dollar firm to, to add up six votes for five contestants to pick the winner. Uh, why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it because they're trying to lend credibility to, to their process, okay? And that's a, that's a big part of auditing, lends credibility to the process. Um, and like I say, we're asked by Congress, uh, we've been, we need to show that we're stewards of the money, good stewards of the money uh, to both them and the American taxpayers. We're getting this money and we're, we're using it in, in a smart way and we have good accountability and stuff. So that's what it's about. Uh, it lends credibility to the process. Uh, so we're going to talk about accounting standards. So to perform audits, you, you got to have standards, right? Uh, this is like a level playing field. As I said, you want consistency. You want them to be fair. You want them to be somewhat uniform. So if we're going to audit one thing, we should be doing that pretty much the same thing for uh, other audits. In that. You know, they're guidelines, the systematic guidelines. And so... Um, you know, these standards, there's really three categories of these standards. Uh, they're, they're what they call general standards. 
uh, field work standards. The general standards are for all the auditors, and we're going to cover some of these. Um, what's required, um, you know, it's like auditor independence and things like that. We're going to cover some of these things. Uh, there's field work standards, which talks about the different types of audits. As I mentioned, there's three audits, and they're all approached differently when we're, we're conducting those three audits. And then uh, there's reporting standards. So we'll talk about that. Um, now, in your book, if you have it, I'm on page 10, it talks about that terrible acronym that I mentioned, GAGUS, Generally Accepted Government Auditing Standards. Uh, as I mentioned, this is referred to as the Yellow Book. It's produced by GAO, and they lay out the standards for the whole federal government. And these standards apply to audits of uh, any government organization, any program activity, things like that. It also applies to uh, any contractor or any nonprofit or any non-governmental governmental organization that's uh, that is getting or has gotten government money. So you think about this. Um, the other day, Rich was talking about when we were talking about family housing. He, were, we were, he was talking about loan and loan guarantees. You know, when we were entered into this public public private venture for contractors to build and maintain family housing, the government uh, co-signed the loan for them to get the money. So if that program was ever to get audited, they use GAGAS. They use the government accounting standards for auditing that program. Um, the last couple of years, many, many organizer, uh, companies have received COVID funding, you know, for lack of work or whatever, uh, COVID assistance funding. That uh, would mean if that stuff ever got around to being audited, they would use GAGAS for those types of audits, not the commercial auditing standards. They use government auditing standards. So uh, let's talk about some of the general standards here. Uh, uh, this is general standards for audits and, and, and audit engagements. And um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about a thing called auditor independence. We're going to talk about each one of these. Auditor independence, auditors have to show professional judgment. They have to be competent. And this thing called quality control and assurance. We're going to look at each one of these individually. So the first one uh, is auditor independence. They always say auditors have to be both independent in mind and independent in appearance. In other words, uh, you want your auditors to be objective and impartial. Okay. Uh, they have to they have to have this independence to allow them to carry out their duties. They have to you know. They want to carry out their duties freely and in an objective manner. Okay, so when you talk about independence of mind, um, auditors should be open-minded when they show up. Okay, open-minded. In other words, you don't want them to come in. Uh, what else? You you want them to come in unbiased. You don't want them coming in with an axe to grind against your organization. You know, maybe they applied for. Uh, a job at your at your organization and they got turned down and they, they've been wringing their hands ever since and now they're wait just can't wait to come in and, and tear you apart okay so you want them to be unbiased you want them to be uh impartial uh when auditors are going through their processes you don't want them jumping to conclusions okay there's a it's a very systematic approach okay that's independence of mind they have to show what they call professional skepticism. Okay, again, be impartial and objective. Uh, independence in appearance. You know, perception is critical. Uh, so auditors, when they're coming in, you want them. You know, they they need to avoid appearing like over friendly. You know, hey, hey, great to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Let's go have a beer after we're done. That type of thing. Uh, you don't want them to be like that. Over. Uh, overly friendly, over familiar, um, you know, they got to appear to be objective and professional. Um, perception is important. You don't want an auditor coming in, 
maybe he worked there at one point in time, or maybe he has a relative, a son or his wife works in that organization, okay? Uh, he may be the most straight arrow that you could find, but again, it's, it's perception. Perception is everything. Okay? So they gotta be independent of mind and independent in appearance. And so uh, these are some of the threats to auditor independence. You can, you can, these are what we call impairments. And you may want to write this down. You could categorize these into three types. <clears throat> First type is what we would call a personal impairment, P-E-R-S-O-N-A-L, personal impairment. Okay. And we'll look at a couple of these things. Uh, the second type is an external impairment. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll cover with what that means. And then the last one is organizational impairments. Okay. Organizational impairments. Those are three types of impairment, personal, external, and organizational. So um, the book has a couple of things here, self-interest threat, and it says the threat that a finance financial or other interests will inappropriately influence an auditor's judgment or behavior. You know, as I mentioned before, maybe he uh, hopes to get a job at your organization or the organization that he's auditing. So he's going to go pretty easy on you, you know, or maybe he wants work there, that type of thing. Uh, a self-review threat, the threat that an auditor or audit organization that provided non-audit services will not appropriate the bell, the bell or evaluate the results. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Auditors at one point in time used to provide management assistance to organizations. In other words, they would get called in to uh, come in with recommendations on how to improve things in that organization. Well, maybe they, they don't do that anymore, by the way but maybe they did it and now they're going back to audit it and they go, man, whoever gave you this idea, okay? So, <laughs> um, yeah, you don't want that. Um, a bias threat, again, this is, a, this is like an ax to grind, you know, threat that an auditor uh, will, as a result of political, ideological, or social convictions, take a not objective position so maybe he's, maybe he's biased against your organization. He's got something against it. Uh, familiarity threat. I already talked about that. You know, maybe have your wife works there, or you have a relative that works there. All those all those ones that I covered fall into this thing called a personal impairment. Okay. Uh, an external impairment would be an undue influence threat. Uh, that would be where uh, you know, threat that external influence or the pressure would impact an auditor's ability to make independent objective judgments. And, um, you know, maybe you're in a hostile area. You know, you go into it, you go into an organization and uh, they're putting things off limit to you uh, that, that you need to see, or they're telling, you know, it's just a hostile environment where you're at. You don't feel comfortable. You feel like you're being pressured by the, uh, organization that you're auditing. And that kind of ties in with the management participation thing. The last one, structural threat. Um, this is a, a, what would, would constitute an organizational threat. The other day when we were looking at the Department of Defense org chart, you know, up at the top of the page, you saw the Secretary of Defense, Deputy Secretary of Defense, and what you saw right next to that, a, a line going right to that, was the, uh, the DOD IG. And you'll find that in just about any organization. If you have an inspector general in your organization, they, don't, they should not be buried somewhere in the organization. They, are, uh, they re report to the top person. Okay? They should have a direct line to the top person. And I'll talk about the DOD IG later on when we get to this. But uh, yeah, structural threat. If you were uh, buried in the organization and you had to go through two or three people to get to the uh, to the head person, then uh, yeah, that would be a structural threat. Okay, so those those are 
constitute auditor independence. <clears throat> uh, this is professional judgment. This is another general standard. So auditors should uh, exercise reasonable care and diligence, maintain integrity, and carefully select methodology that they're going to use for gathering information. Um, professional judgment means they need to apply the, you know, the knowledge, the skills, the experience. Uh, when they're developing an opinion or a discussion, and they use the standards. Okay, um, it says exercise reasonable care and diligence. Okay, be objective, gather all the facts, don't jump to conclusions, don't rush to judgment, as they say. Okay, maintain high degrees of integrity. Uh, you have to keep your personal opinion separate. Use professional judgment. Um, We'll talk about when they are developing the scope of work and the methodologies they're going to use. Uh, they have to plan out the work, what they're going to cover, what they're going to audit, the amount of sampling they're going to do. Um, we're going to talk about this thing called scope of work. Auditors, um, you know, when they come to audit your organization, they have to stay within the scope of work. They can't, they can't just go wandering around until they find something. You, could, you always have the right to ask an auditor, you know, what's your scope? What's the scope of this audit? Um, <clears throat> auditors need to exercise professional skepticism. Um, you know, don't be satisfied with less than, than persuasive evidence. We'll talk about judgmental samplings and things later on. Um, auditors should come in. They shouldn't assume that you're honest or dishonest. Again, come in with an open mind. And they should obtain reasonable, not absolute assurance that material statements will not occur. Auditors come in, they have time constraints, they have budget constraints. You know, they can only do so much within the certain, within their scope of the audit. They only have so much time and so many resources. So all those things kind of tie into this thing called uh, professional judgment. Uh, competence, and uh, you might see a test question or two off this page. Um, auditors have to be competent. Uh, they have to have technical knowledge of GAGIS. They have to have good uh, communication skills, both oral skills and in writing. Okay. Um, in your book, I'm on page 14, if you have it, uh, auditors, and you want to write this down if you don't have it, they must complete 80 hours of continuing professional education, CPEs, every two years. Okay, they got to have 80 hours of CPEs every two years with a minimum of 20 hours completed in any one of the two years. In other words, they can't take all 81 years. So they have to complete at least 20 in one of those two years. And at least 24 of the 80 hours must be directly related to government auditing. Okay, so eight, they have, to have 80 hours every two years, at least 20 of those hours in one of the years and at least 24 must be auditing related. Uh, this is true of government auditing, and this is true in commercial auditing. Uh, and my daughter is, a, is an auditor, uh, and the, this is, she, she works on the, in the private sector, and um, they are very, very strict about this. Uh, if, because if they sign off on an audit, and they don't have their CPEs, those, those audits are invalid. Okay? Companies are paying them big bucks to come in there and do Sarbanes-Oxley reviews and internal audits and looking at their internal controls, things like that, doing risk assessments. And if these auditors are not current with all their CPEs, um, one, the, the auditor is gonna get fired and the company's gonna probably sue the, 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 the the accounting firm. Okay. So it's very important. I remember one time I was teaching a class and, uh, you know, when we used to do these things in person, we'd go around the room and the individuals would introduce themselves and tell, talk about what they, what job they had and what they're doing. And one guy, one time, he, uh, 
he said uh, he's an auditor and he's retiring in like two weeks. And I'm thinking, okay, I had to ask, I go, so why are you taking this class? You're retiring in two weeks. And his answer was he had done auditing and he had signed off on some audits and he hadn't completed all his CPEs for the year. And so he was getting his CPEs. So yeah, this is, this is uh, very, you know, this is very much controlled and uh, tightly watched. Um, and so make sure you, you note that. Uh, it goes on in this page that audit organizations are responsible for ensuring that staff members collectively, and that's a key word, have the necessary skills, knowledge to conduct the audit. So what that means is every individual doesn't have to be knowledgeable of everything, but collectively they have, have to have enough uh, knowledge of, and skills and discipline to conduct whatever it is they're auditing. Uh, you know, we call this what? Institutional knowledge. You have to have that. Okay. So auditors also need, you know, they need, uh, I said, good communication skills, good writing skills. They should be able to, uh, they should be up on statistics. They should have good analytical abilities. Okay. They're going to do things like sampling, random sampling, you know, inferential sampling. Okay. Sir? Yes? This might be kind of a stupid question, but just to validate, the when that says collectively, it means collectively on any team on a given project, right? You can't claim, oh, well, we have so-and-so on staff. If so-and-so is not working on a specific audit project, that, that's not going to cover correct. this yeah you're correct yeah on, on that on that audit yes yeah yeah they can't say they got somebody in the organization so yeah they need to have to show that they have um you know like, again the, the skills the experience the knowledge of collectively to do that And the last one of these that we talked about on um, the standards are quality, um, quality control and assurance. Okay. Um, first off, it says each auto organization must establish a system to provide reasonable assurance that the audit organization and its personnel comply with the professional standards. So all those standards that I just covered, they have to show that they have uh, a good their, their hands on making sure all of that occurs and takes place that the folks are, are getting their cpes that the folks are being uh, independent of mine and the parents when they conduct audits so they have to have a system of quality controls and assurance and they, and they have that's part of their reasonable assurance okay uh, also and this is a you may see this as a test question on your exam Audit organizations uh, must have an, what they call an external peer review at least once every three year. Okay, so it has to be an external peer review. In other words, depending on what echelon they are, it has to be someone at that same echelon level that's conducting their peer review. So, for example, in the services, you know, we have Navy Audit Service. Army has an audit service. Air Force has an audit service. I'm sure Space Command will have an audit service. What they do is they, they um, every three years, they will audit each other, okay? They go out and conduct audits of each other to make sure they're in compliance with all these other standards that I, that I just covered. Um, it's an audit of the auditors, if you will. And um, so think about this. You look at the different audit agencies. Okay, so it's got to be a peer review. Who's the top audit organization that we have in the federal government? Well, it's GAO. Who's their peer in, in the United States? Uh, they don't have one. So the way GAO um, works this, there is an organization, and uh, you don't need to know this for testing purposes, it's called the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions. Okay, uh, it's kind of a worldwide organization of countries that have audit organizations like GAO. And uh, this 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 uh, institution, it's it's headquartered in Vienna, 
And so GAO may get reviewed. I think its last review was conducted by Norway. Okay. They go out and audit each other. And again, that's to be in compliance with uh, these general standards. Okay. Uh, let me give you a little write in here. And I just have it on this page. I'll probably talk about it again later. But uh, Gagas, here, write, write this down. This is one of those white space notes. Uh, Gagas requires auditors, Gagas requires auditors to perform follow-up, to perform follow-up on previously reported material findings. Gagas requires auditors to perform follow-up on previously reported material findings. You know, so if we have a material weakness and uh, we reported on it, and we may be correcting, you know, in the process of trying to correct it. But uh, if you're getting an audit during that time, auditors are going to come in and look at that. And they're going to look at ones that you may have reported on that you said have been corrected. Okay. So they're going to, they're going to look at your material weaknesses. Okay, uh, GAO standards, okay. So standards define how audits are going to be performed, okay. And uh, there's different standards for each type of audit. And I mentioned before, there's, there's three main types here. We have financial audits, okay. Financial audits would be audits of the financial statements. There's uh, very strict rules when we're, when we're uh, when they're reporting and auditing financial statements. Pretty much financial statements or a financial statement is a financial statement. So they're all going to be looked at fairly similarly. Uh, no, there are separate standards then for performance audits. Uh, performance audits are the abundance of audits that are done. Probably 90, you look at 90% of all audits they fall under the performance audit category, okay? Uh, performance audits can be things like when they're looking at programs, they may be looking at a weapon system, they may be looking at a specific function or an operation or a system, okay? Uh, and their auditors come in to see if these things are achieving their objectives. I'm on the, uh, I told you, I'm on the GAO distribution list for for things like this, anybody could get on these lists. And I must get three or four of these a day of what GAO is uh, auditing or, or report on what they have audited or currently auditing. And um, that's, as I said, the bulk of audits are performance audits. And each one of those are, is done uh, differently because it depends on what it is they're auditing. Are they auditing a program, a weapon system, a function, a procedure? system you know so they a uh, little more flexibility when they're doing performance audits and uh, the last type uh, is what's called an attestate at, ah, well, attestation engagement okay uh, these are i don't know if they're really audits per se this is when you know we call in maybe auditors to uh, witness or observe or to authenticate uh, something that we're doing. We want to. It's like a double check. We want to see if, um, let's say, we've set up our internal controls and we think we got them pretty good. But I want uh, I want auditors to come in to do an attestation to attest and kind of look at it and see if they see any faults in what I've set up. Okay, not a formal audit. It, it's, it's almost where you're inviting them to come in. So those are the, and, the, and there's going to be different standards for each of these types. The standards are going to vary. So I talked about the yellow book, um, yellow book standards for financial audits. Um, one of the things that they're always going to look at for financial audits, I said financial audits are, are pretty strict, they're pretty much by the book. Uh, when they're conducting a financial audit, you may want to write some of this down if you don't have a book. 
Uh, they're looking for compliance with GAAP. Okay, compliance with G, you know, generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, they're looking for consistency and with the application of accounting pr uh, principles. They're looking for, are you being consistent in you know, how you apply the different accounting principles? Uh, the, when we do a financial report, we have to do what's called management discussion and analysis. And so are management's disclosures adequate? Is management adequately disclosing everything? And then uh, finally, financial statements, auditors have to render an opinion. So that's gonna be, that's another requirement. They have to render an opinion. So the four things, again, compliance with GAAP, consistency of accounting principles, management's, is management's disclosure adequate? And they have to render an audit opinion. Again, like I said, financial statements, uh, not a lot of flexibility for auditors. I mentioned the DOD IG uh, earlier. Um, back in uh, 1978, there was a law passed, and this was passed by the uh, 95th Congress. And it's, uh, if you want to write it down, it's not testable, but it's Public Law 95-452. And um, what that law did, it created IG positions at about, uh, I don't know, 15 or so federal agencies. And DOD is one of those federal agencies, mainly the, at the time of the, the key federal agencies. And uh, these individuals that were going to fill these jobs uh, were going to be appointed by the president confirmed by the Senate, and their job was to report directly to the head of the agency and to Congress, okay, on any internal issues to that organization. Uh, they have to report to Congress every six months. And uh, if you're the head of that agency, you are required, and it's spelled out in the law, you are required, you can't interfere or obstruct anything these guys are doing, okay? Um, so they were truly in the independent. Again, and they, again, they report to Congress. Uh, they, you know, they needed to keep the head of the agency informed of what they were doing, but he could not interfere or obstruct anything they were doing. And uh, if he didn't like what they were doing, he could not retaliate or take any type of action against these individuals. Again, they were independent and stuff. Uh, so in DOD, we have what an individual called DOD Inspector General. And I mentioned him earlier. If you look, go look back at that org chart, you'll see he's a direct report to the Secretary of Defense. And again, he's there to serve as an independent and objective official in DOD. Uh, so this chart just lists out uh, what he's responsible for or some of the some of his functions conduct supervises and initiate audits and investigations make recommendations that he sees uh, for economy efficiency in the organization okay uh, recommends policies for prevention and detection of fraud and abuse but just remember these folks are independent uh, and they only report to that in the head of the organization and then they report back to Congress. And this is where I talked about organizational or structural independence. Okay, they're, they're at the top of the org chart there. So here um, in DOD, these are the audit organizations that we have. Uh, but as I mentioned before, we have Army Audit, uh, Air Force Audit, and uh, the Navy, you know, we call ours the Navy, Navy Audit Service. Uh, each of these organizations are independent. They, uh, each of these also have a criminal investigative side. Okay, so if an auditor is out doing an inspection 
and they start sensing that there's criminal issues involved. You know, it's not just that we're not following procedures or, you know, if they suspect that there's something criminal involved, the auditors don't do that. They go back to the office and they, that's when they bring in, you know, the NCIS guys and so on. I was talking about NCIS the other day when I explained, uh, when I was telling you the story about the murder that had taken place at the uh, organization across the street from where I was working. You remember the guy was embezzling travel, travel funds. Okay. So uh, yeah, each has a criminal investig uh, side and each reports directly to the highest level in their component. So uh, head of Navy Audit Service reports directly to SECNAV. Army Audit Agency reports to Secretary of the Army and so on. Um, on this page, if you have a book, it does talk about GAO. And you know, we've, we've mentioned this before, the head of GAO is the person called the Comptroller General of the United States, ComGen. And uh, we mentioned that that person, when he is selected for that position, that then he uh, is, serves a 15 year appointment. Uh, it's not in the book, but Rich mentioned that after that 15 year appointment, he can retire on full salary. So the guy that's filling that position right now is a guy named Gene Dodaro. And uh, Gene Dodaro, he, uh, he actually came from GAO. He had worked 30 years in GAO, and then he got picked to be the Comptroller General. So I think he, uh, he has been ComGen now since 2010. So he's, uh, he's in his 12th year there. So he might be, he's gonna have about 45 years tenure by the time he retires and stuff. But uh, so if he sticks around for the full 15 uh, for another three years, then we'll get a new Comptroller General. Uh, the way this individual is picked is kind of interesting. It's not, it's not testable, but they, they try to get someone that's fully, really independent. So both the House and the Senate put together a couple of names. The House picks a couple of names, the Senate picks a couple of names, and they send that up to the president, those names up to the president. He, uh, he picks one of those, and then it goes back to the Senate for confirmation. So this is kind of a, one of these partnerships between the legislative branch and the executive branch. You know, again, you want this person to be fully uh, independent. You don't want him to, you know, be politically tied to anybody. Uh, DOD internal audit, it's not really much to report here. Um, can't, uh, they, so the audit organizations, this is the things that the audit organizations ensure that they have plans, uh, just like everybody else have policies, um, try to minimize fraud, waste and abuse. Not much there. Okay, this one here. Um, do you, it says DOD can contract out for non-federal auditors. Okay, in other words, um, if we have such a either a surge requirement, or you know we're auditing a subject that is so technical, we don't have the institutional knowledge, we don't have the collective knowledge to conduct the audit, we can actually contract out uh, with audit firms, an audit firm that has those have those capabilities. Um, when, right after the stock market crash back in 20, uh, 2009, remember when the housing market uh, imploded and all of your thrift savings plans were worth about 50% uh, less in a matter of weeks. Um, Congress passed this uh, American Recovery Act, another one of these billion dollar or trillion dollar budgets. And this was at that time put out there for what they called shovel ready work, all right? Shovel ready work, where if cities or whatever uh, needed projects, uh, give us a list of projects, we'll throw some money at it. 
Okay. Well, uh, so cities and states got some of that work for shovel ready projects. And then also the federal government got work for shovel ready projects. We have, you know, we had projects, we had a list of projects that we could use money for on bases and things like that. Uh, when all that money was put out there, a couple of years later, uh, all that money had to be audited. Well, we didn't have enough auditors in DOD and government to go out and conduct audits for all those. That was like a trillion dollars that got put out there. So um, they, uh, they had to actually hire companies to supplement our audit staff to go out there and con help conduct some of these audits. Now I'm going to give you a write in, uh, in the white space note here. <clears throat> Write this down. GAO will not contract out the audit of the US financial statements. GAO will not contract out audit of the US financial statements. You know, Rich, when he was covering accounting, he was talking about uh, when the when the Treasury produces the financial statements for the federal government, those things need to be audited. And GAO is the ones that audit them. Well, that's not a function they could contract out. That's basically all that says. Okay, let's look at the three types of audits a little closer here. Now, if you have a book, uh, it shows this slide and on the, on the next page, on page 22, it has a nice table. Remember I talked about tables of place, there are a lot of questions. But I'll talk about the, so each one of these here. So financial audits. Uh, financial audits, those are things, you know, audit of some of our major financial statements like the trial balance, the statement of budgetary resources, net statement of net cost, and so on. Um, financial audits, uh, the objectives for financial audits are predetermined and not defined by the audit organization. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, these things are pretty standardized. The audit agency can't come in and uh, decide how they're going to audit those things. Those are, those are very standardized. Those are very strict. You know, a trial balance is a trial balance. And so when they're looking at these things, they're looking at to make sure they're in accordance with the established criteria, that uh, they're in compliance with uh, all the requirements that are stated, uh, that there's an internal control structure in place. Okay. So for financial audits, the auditors have, uh, for the most part, no flexibility when it comes to defining them. They have to follow the standard very closely. Performance audits, on the other hand, uh, the objectives may vary, they vary widely, okay? And this, as I mentioned, this is where we're looking at, we could look at, we could be looking at a weapon system, we could be looking at uh, an organization, we could be looking at a function, a, uh, a system, you know, they may come in and audit DTS. Uh, so th these vary, uh, they vary widely. And uh, so objectives for performance audits vary and generally do differ for, they're different for each audit. And these are defined by the audit organization. So depending on what it is they're going to be looking at, that's how they scope these things out and how they assess on how they're going to be on conducting the audit. And then finally, attestation engagements. I said, you know, attestation engagements, uh, this is generally when we call in auditors asking them for an opinion or to look at something for us, uh, maybe observe one of our processes. Okay. And again, these things, uh, it's going to vary. It's going to vary depending on what it is. Okay. We don't do a lot of attestation engagements anymore. So performance audit seems to be the majority of what, what are done. Um, we'll talk about non-audit services. Um, you know, auditors, uh, they can be called in 
uh, to maybe evaluate a new program or, or to uh, look at the methods and the approaches, they should not be coming in and recommending any changes or assisting management. They can just come in and observe and maybe come up with some recommendations on how to evaluate a program, but they shouldn't be coming in to recommend any changes to that program. Uh, they can be used to perform investigative work, those types of things. Um, I, as I mentioned before, there used to, was a time when auditors would come in and they would conduct, uh, they would perform management functions or man management assist visits. I remember back in the day, maybe audit service uh, organizations would call them up and say, we want you to come over and conduct a management assist visit. And they would, and they would come over and they would provide recommendations on how to run your business. And then, uh, you know, two, three years later, you get a, a group of, a different group of auditors coming in there and uh, they're, they're tearing you apart because they don't like what they see. They say, who recommended this? So they have gotten out of that business. Okay. Um, how many of you have ever heard or remember the Enron story? Okay, um, <clears throat> Enron was a, was, a, was a company. Okay, it was a, a very large energy company located down in uh, Houston, Texas, and it, it was a big company. They every year they had about a hundred billion dollars in revenue, and uh, employed I guess they employed 30,000 folks. And they were they were big. They were a very big, successful company. Uh, their stocks were always on the upswing. So uh, very popular company. You know, a lot of people had heard of Enron. A lot of investors invested money in Enron. Uh, and why wouldn't you? They were, uh, you know, as I said, billion dollars of revenue every year. Uh, they were picked one for six years in a row by Fortune magazine as the most innovative company in America. Okay, they were selected by Fortune, Fortune, uh, Fortune Magazine as the most, most innovative company in America. Well, they were innovative sir, already. Sir, yes. were they the company that was too big to fail, as I recall? Uh, that was about banks. No, that was, that was oh, about okay. banks. Uh, they, okay. when, when they were talking about too big to fail, they were talking about some of the some of the large banks. That was that was later on. That was in the 2009 when the the banks uh, were loaning out all the money, and uh, again the housing market imploded. Okay, because I remember that the Houston football stadium was named after them. No, the well, Enron they, Stadium. They maybe they maybe yeah. that's where they got it from. Okay, maybe that, maybe that's where they got it from. Uh, but yeah, as I said, they were they were picked by Fortune magazine as one of the or as the most innovative company in America. Well, they were innovative, all right. Um, they had one of the big accounting firms at that time. It was uh, Arthur Anderson. Arthur Anderson was, uh, as, as I said, there's there were five big accounting firms in the United States, and they were one of the biggest. They had Arthur Anderson come in and provide management assistance. Okay. There was nothing wrong with that, okay? But they were providing recommendations on, you know, how to run your business, how to, how to uh, keep their books and things like that. Uh, problem was they also had Arthur Anderson conducting their audits at the end of each year, okay? And um, there were a couple bad apples, both in Enron and Arthur Anderson. And they were doing what they call cooking the books. You know what we call cooking the books because every year their stock was worth more and more and more and people were investing a lot of money in that well when it came to, to light that they're they're you know they were not recording their assets uh properly and they were over inflating uh their their worth and everything like that all that came to light uh their stock dropped about 98 percent in a matter of two weeks and people lost millions and millions of dollars. And uh, these guys, you know, they all ended up in jail. There was a guy named Ken Lay. You may remember hearing about that name in the news. I don't know, these guys got big, long prison sentences. Uh, Arthur Anderson uh, got disbanded and broke apart. Uh, the people from Arthur Anderson went to jail. 
And what came out of all this thing, and Richard was talking about it, the thing called Sarbanes-Oxley law, rules and laws and stuff. So um, that's why, you know, it all ties back to this slide. That's why auditors, that's not reason, but uh, it's one of those things. You don't do management when you're doing auditing. You want to keep it separate. Yeah, they, may, they probably were too big to fail, but they failed anyway, so. Okay, we're going to talk about auditing now. We're going to talk about the audit plan, okay? Um, so the audit plan, before, before the audit kicks off, um, we're going to decide what to audit, okay? Areas that need auditing. So uh, when you're developing an audit plan, uh, a couple things they're going to be looking at. They're going to be looking at, uh, for example, let's say, uh, BUMED is going to get audited. Well, they're going to look, uh, they're probably going to go to uh, first thing, look at, you know, customer, maybe customers have issues with uh, BUMED. Uh, Congress may want certain things looked at in the medical community. Uh, they're going to look at your last audit, when was the last audit, and what kind of findings uh, were identified in your last audit. Uh, let me tell you what Navy does when they're putting together an audit plan. They will call, uh, for example, I was down in New Orleans working with Naval Reserves. I would get a call from Navy Audit Service and I, they may say something like, uh, we're getting ready to go audit Spay War San Diego. Do you have any issues with them? And if we had any issues with them, I'd, I'd let the auditors know. Or they may be saying we're going to go audit PAC fleet or Atlantic fleet. Okay. And uh, likewise, when uh, they're going to audit the Naval Reserves, they would call up these other major commands and say, hey, do you have any issues with the Naval Reserves that you want us to look at? So all this feeds into the audit plan. Um, they gather this information. They also look at uh, what they call high risk areas. Every year, Congress puts out a what they call a high risk list, and there's like 36 items on there uh, that they they look at across the government, and uh, cybersecurity is one of them. Okay, so uh, that, that that's going to be on. They're going to that's one of the things auditors may be looking at. Okay, so there as they this is all feeds into this thing called the audit plan. Uh, they're going to look at your last statement of assurance that you submitted, and they're going to see what you identified. Did you have any material weaknesses? Those types of things. If you or were correcting on some material weaknesses or have tried to correct previous material weaknesses. So all these things uh, feed into the audit plan. And this is what takes place uh, when they're getting ready to go out there. They're going to... Think about your internal controls, okay? They're gonna look at your last audit. Probably one of the worst things you can do uh, is uh, not have corrected previous audit findings, okay? And I know a lot of you, if you've ever been through, uh, you know, you get wind that you're gonna get an inspection or an audit, and they're gonna come in and look at your whole organization. The first thing you're gonna, you should do is go back and look at the last audit and if there was anything identified, you want to make sure those have been corrected. A repeat finding is not good. So all that all that information feeds into the audit plan. And then uh, we start talking about the phases of the audit. And there's three phases, and there's going to be a lot of questions on your exam from these next three parts, what takes place in the planning phase, the review phase, and the reporting phase. So I'm going to cover the first thing I'm going to do is cover the cover the planning phase. Okay. Okay. So um, if you have a book on page 25, it says the basic tool used by auditors to organize and control audits is referred to as the audit program. Okay, so the audit program, basic tool used by auditors to organize and control audits. 
And uh, this is the three phases of every audit. Let's talk about the planning phase first. So uh, in, in the planning phase, this is where the auditors select the most important area that the, the audit's gonna cover. This is where they're laying out the scope. Okay, they're defining, in other words, they're defining the boundaries. Uh, the scope means, you know, what programs are we gonna review? Uh, what type of documents do we intend to look at? Uh, how long are we gonna be there? How long are we gonna be on site? Or how long is the review going to take place? And, uh, you know, if the organization or whatever is in several locations, you know, uh, what locations do we need to visit? All this ties into the scope of the audit. Okay. And they're, they're defining the objectives. Uh, they start looking at the methodology, you know, uh, what type of sampling are we going to do? How are we going to collect data? Uh, are we going to conduct interviews? You know, we're going to take all the... Uh, GS5s off into a room and talk to them. Uh, we're gonna we're going to look at the you know all the military on one side, all the civilians on the other. Uh, what type of methodology? What if, you know if we're looking at documents, or we're going to be doing statistical sampling, and if so, how much? Those types of things. Uh, I got something here. I want you to highlight if you have a book. And I'll read it to you if you don't. It said, audit results from judgmental samplings apply only to those items sampled. So if you have a book, I want you to highlight that for testing purposes. If you don't have a book, write this down again. Audit results from judgmental samplings apply only to those items sampled. So what's a judgmental sampling? Uh, that's a non-random sampling. This is a sampling that the auditor, uh, based on his experience and his knowledge and his professional judgment, he thinks I need to sample this item, okay? Um, that's all well and good, but sometimes these things are subject to bias also, okay? So that's why I, that's why I say they're only, they can only apply, be applied to those items that have been sampled. You can't make a, in other words, you can't make a, uh, inferential judgment about those things. You can't say, um, you can't, like we talk about inferential statistics, I'm trying to draw a conclusion based on a couple of samples. No, you can't do that. They only apply to what you've sampled. Uh, other things, as I mentioned this before, auditors Sir, are going, yes. I uh, apologize for interrupting. Can you no, repeat what needed to be written down again in that part? Uh, Audit results from judgmental samplings apply only to those items sampled. Thank you. So if you're doing a judgmental sampling, again, you're you're doing that. That means it's non-random. I've gone, I want to, I want to look at this, this, and this. Um, because from my experience, I know that that's where to look, that's where to look, that's where to look. Those can be sometimes interpreted as bias. And so you do not, you can't draw uh, a conclusion just based on your judgmental sampling. Okay. And then finally, auditors, again, I mentioned this, they're going to look at prior findings. They're going to look at your prior findings uh, when they're coming down to, uh, when they're putting together the plan for the audit. And again, you don't want to have, you don't want to have repeat findings if you can avoid them. Okay, so that all takes place in the planning phase. That's, uh, that takes place before the auditors go on site. Then next phase is the review phase. Okay. And this is where the majority of the work of the audit takes place. And you know, some of it may be done at your office, but a lot of it is usually done on location. And so, um, in your book, I've got five test questions off page 26. So you want to read this very carefully when you uh, when you get your books. Okay. So it says uh, auditors will go where the information leads them, and they 
but they must stay within the purpose and scope of the audit. So this is where they're gather, gathering audit evidence. Okay? So they go with their information leads them, but they have to stay within the purpose and scope of the audit. Um, areas they're gonna look at, they're gonna look at prior performance. They're gonna look at things like, um, they're, you know, performance of similar entities. The other day I talked about benchmarking. Remember, this is where you compare with what you do with what they call best in class. So uh, if you have a function that someone else has a similar function, they're gonna, they're gonna try to compare your performance. They're gonna benchmark your performance against best in class. Uh, again, they're gonna look at the previous findings or recommendations that have been reported. Okay. Um, Next line here, it says, for financial audits, evidence must be sufficient and appropriate. Must be sufficient and appropriate. Sufficiency means the quantity of the evidence. And appropriateness means quality. Is it relevant? Is it valid? Is it reliable? Okay. So sufficient means quantity. Uh, appropriate is the quality. And uh, so all this takes place in the audit review phase. Uh, the very bottom paragraph, uh, if you have a book, I would highlight that little, last little paragraph. It says, uh, standards require that auditors document the evidence they gather in a, in a form of documentation. And they call these, or they used to call them, but I think they still do, they call these working papers. So they gather all this information and it's called, uh, they call it audit documentation or working papers. So this is where they're gathering the evidence of the audit. And again, most of this takes place on site, but they, they go back and forth to their office. <clears throat> the last phase, and this is probably an auditor's least favorite phase, is the reporting phase. Um, so uh, this is where their communication skills come into play. They have to be good writers, uh, have good communication skills. Generally, if you have an audit, uh, auditors will have an, both in, they will conduct both an in brief and an out brief with uh, you know key members in the organization. And on the out brief, they will talk about well, in brief. They will talk about what they're going to look at. On the out brief, they'll talk about what they looked at and some of their initial findings. Uh, then they will go back on site and uh, could, you know, write this down formally. Uh, when auditors, this is where the good writing skills come into play because auditors, when they write these things, they should be able to write it in such a, such a manner that anyone that, even if you weren't involved in the audit, you could understand what was looked at, how it was conducted and so on, and the findings. So it said most audits require conclusion or opinion, okay? And so, um, as I said, auditors, uh, they have to render an opinion. If they're conducting a financial audit, they have to render an opinion. So there are four types of opinions that auditors can render. Uh, let me write these down because they're not on the slide. Or let me, let me give you these because they're not on the slide. They are in the book. Uh, the first type is what we call unmodified. Remember I talked about that the other day when we were talking about statement of assurance. Means uh, that's the best. Nothing's been modified. It's, it's, the best, it's the best opinion you can get. Uh, the next one down is a modified opinion. Uh, basically that means things look good. However, you know, they may have a, you know, there may be a couple of findings in there. Uh, the third is what we have in DOD. It's uh, called a disclaimer, which means they're unable to render an opinion. And finally, uh, it's the worst is adverse. Maybe after we get rid of our disclaimer, we'll and they can finally audit it. We'll give them the adverse opinion. I don't know. Hope not. But <laughs> But uh, at birth, that's where there, there are material misstatements of facts and failure to follow generally accepted accounting principles. So those are the four opinions. 
and so they have to uh, they have to state one of these when they're conducting a financial audit, and that's a financial audit. Um, talk about that a little bit. So also financial, the, the, the standards require that they include whether the statements were in accordance with GAAP. Uh, there, are they consistent? Uh, I, I think I gave you these. Whether uh, management disclosures were reasonably adequate and then have the statement of opinion. So I already gave you these. But uh, so you want to highlight that slide. That's that's what uh, financial standards require. Financial audits require, rather. Uh, audit reports. They these things are written. Uh, they have to be retrievable and stuff. Um, and state the findings. Put the report there. Auditors generally have to, uh, part of the findings, they have to state the condition. You know, that's what these reports will contain, state the condition. In other words, what uh, circumstances regarding the audit objective, in other words, what did they find? What did they find? Uh, they'll state the criteria, basically what should it have been, okay? This is what we found. This is what it should have been. And they may at that time quote laws, regulations, uh, best practices, or whatever, if they, you know, if they benchmark you against someone else. Uh, the effect, that means the impact. Uh, so what, you know, was money wasted, programs not operating as efficiently, uh, money could have been put to better use, that type of thing. Uh, lost inventory, whatever. They have to they have to give the impact. Um, like I say, it's often in dollars, but it could be uh, it could be other things too. Money, you know, money could have been put to better use. Uh, readiness was impacted. Things like that. Uh, and then what caused it? You know, why did this happen? You know, no, there's no policy, no training, not enough internal controls. Okay. And generally, auditors will come out, it's not on the slide, they'll come out with what's called the fifth element, and that will be their recommendation. Okay. What should be? And they'll come up with a recommendation on how to approve that. Uh, GAO does that just about in every one of their performance audits. Now, uh, audit reports, they will. Um, they like to show, auditors always like to show return on investment for their work. Uh, GAO does this all the time. You know, basically they, they say, if you give me more and more money, I could find you more money. So they wanna show a return on investment on their work. And so uh, when they're in their findings, they uh, will sometimes have monetary benefits and non-monetary benefits stated. Uh, monetary benefits, when they, you know, they may say that money was lost in this project, money was wasted, uh, could be things like this item is too expensive, there's ways to get it done cheaper, uh, money could have been put to better use, that type of thing. And if they have a dollar amount, they'll include dollar amounts in there. Uh, Non-monetary, again, uh, may be things like the program is not performing as designed, uh, Readiness is it was impacted. Uh, it's not efficient, not efficient, not effective. Uh, there's safety issues. Uh, there's accuracy of data. These are all non-monetary things. You know, uh, it's not in compliance with the law. So they'll break their a lot of their findings out into uh, these two categories. And then uh, the slide you've been waiting for all week, <laughs> internal review, or review of internal controls, rather. Uh, GAGIS requires that auditors review internal control procedures. Okay? 
and uh, they're going to they're going to go to the green book and apply the GAO standards. So when you're taking the CDFM exam, uh, you know I talked about those five GAO those standards in the green book. Remember control environment. I talked about the tone at the top. Uh, I talked about risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. Uh, you're going to get a lot of test questions on those. Uh, that was that was uh, module one, right? Competency three, module one. You're going to get a lot of questions on those in module one. You're going to get the, some of those same questions when you take the module three exam. Okay, so so brush up on those green book five GAO green book standards. And so internal controls, um, let me give you some things to write in on this page. So write this down. Weak internal controls, weak internal controls in an audit area will lead auditors, will lead auditors to target their actions. Okay, weak internal controls in an audit area will lead auditors to target their actions. In other words, if they're going around and they're they're conducting, uh, they're interviewing your staff, going through your procedures, and they sense that there's a, uh, maybe you don't have enough separation of duty among some of your employees that are doing the work. If they sense that, that's going to, you know, that's going to focus their attention. Okay. So uh, have you write that down, write this down also. When auditing financial auditor, when auditing financial auditors should evaluate internal controls on your systems. Okay. When auditing financial audit, financial auditors should evaluate internal controls on system systems. Okay. So internal controls are a big uh, big issue. Like I say, if they sense that there's weakness there. Uh, that's going to that's going to draw their attention so make you make sure you have you know good re reconciliation efforts good internal separation of duties uh, good inventory control points those types of things uh, sir a question um, yes. regarding that last statement um, should evaluate internal controls on systems Yes. Is that the systems that we use in the U.S. government that are already like uh, uh, manufactured in? I, I didn't just understand no, that. On no, no. Uh, if you system. have a system, if you have a system, you, maybe you have a feeder system into something, you know, that's feeding data. If you have a, uh, maybe you have a system that produces your financial documents and stuff, and then that feeds into uh, Sabers or ERP or whatever you're using. Again, these are like front end systems. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. That was, uh, stop sharing that. That was auditing. That was the last slide there. Uh, as I said, if you are interested, let's do this. If you are interested in seeing a couple of questions, I could pull that up real quick. Let me. Um... You all see that? Not yet. Dave, I've got those uh, sample questions as well. You want me to try to do you, do you have them? I'm, I'm... Say what? 
Yeah, um, hold on. Yeah, okay. okay. I can open them. I think you can talk to them if you want. Oh, oh, I got them here. Uh, wait a minute. I'm almost there. All right. Sorry. While Dave's working for the, or looking for those, <clears throat> uh, let me um, thank all of you for your attendance and <clears throat> the um, and wish you the best of luck on everything you're going to do. Certainly, I'm passing that exam. Do, do you have those? No, do not see them. Yep, we're almost I, there. We could get the sale. You can see oh, us. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let me um, let me go. Let me go. Let me go up here. Okay. Real quick. Um, okay. So um, this there are usually seven types of questions that are asked, and these are, this breaks them out into different types. I'll show you an example of each one. As you see, the comprehensive evalu and the evaluation, and then complex multiple choice, uh, what they call negative elimination, calculation, graphical, and true and false. So let me go down here. Uh, so this would be an example of a comprehensive, uh, this basic knowledge question. And, um, you know, we covered this in accounting. And uh, so this is one of those jumps right out at you. So it ask, it's asking you, uh, you know, this is what Rich covered in accounting. What's the equation for financial proprietary accounting? And of course, it's assets equal liability plus net position. Okay, so that's a sample of basic knowledge. Those are those are the easy ones that I that I think in. Uh, I mean, they they jump out at you. You either know it or don't know it. Uh, these are evaluation. We call it the best answer. So it asks the question: What statement characterized the authority of the authorizing and appropriating committees of Congress with regards to the defense bill? Uh, authorizing committees must adhere to decisions made by the appropriating committees. Pro uh, B, appropriating committees must adhere to decisions made by authorizing committees. C, appropriating committees generally adhere to decisions made by authorizing committees, unless the appropriate authorization chairperson grants a waiver. Did we talk anything about waivers? Or D, appropriating committees generally adhere to decisions made by the authorizing committees but are not required to do so, okay? So when, you know, when you're looking at a question like this where it says must in the first two choices, you know, uh, must, that kind of gives you away anyway when you're taking it the exam. So yeah, it's the last one here. Uh, third type, and th these are fall under what's called complex multiple choices, okay? Uh, you will see a couple of these on the exam. These are the ones um, I, that I dislike the most. So um, it says regarding the awarding of a replacement contract, okay, remember when we we're talking about termination, which of the following conditions must be met? Replacement contract within the same scope as the original contract. Remember, we said yes to that, right? Replacement contract doesn't exceed the cost of the original contract. Eh, replacement contract awarded without undue lay. I remember that. And the bona fide need for the goods and service must continue to exist. So I'm pretty sure it's not, it's, it's all of them except the second one. So, but that's not what they're asking you. They're, they're asking you, you know, choices here. Is it number one, two, or four, or one, three, and four? So what you will do then is look for the ones that don't contain, uh, you know, the second, the one with two new Roman numerals, which of course is B. You will see a couple of these on the exam. Take your time, read them carefully. Uh, 
Next one is what I call negative elimination. Uh, it says regarding, remember the FAIR Act, we talked about the FAIR Act and OMB Circular A76, which is not one of the stated policies of the government. Uh, a, achieve economy and enhance productivity, retain inherently governmental functions in-house, maximizing outsourcing and privatization, and rely on commercial sector where it is more economical. So this is one of those not type questions that we always mention. And uh, if you look at it, right, we, you know, maximizing outsourcing and privatization, you know, we're, it's not tr trying, we're not trying to see how much we can outsource. So this is one of those not type questions. Uh, this is a calculation. So uh, this was when Rich was talking about the program acquisition unit cost. Okay, so uh, they give you some numbers. Okay, given the following life cycle estimated cost of the new weapon system, broken out by appropriation, uh, calculate the program acquisition unit cost if you're fielding 500 uh, fully configured end units. So you need to know, know what, remember what goes into program acquisition unit cost. And remember we talked about it included RDT&E, it included procurement, it included O&M, uh, but there were some things it did not include, right? It, okay. And so you add these together. I did, didn't include all of my rather. And then uh, you'll, you'll get a couple of graphical ones, okay? And it's a, the illustration below is an example of what? A histogram, a normal distribution, a positively skewed distribution, or a negatively skewed distribution. So we know it's not a normal distribution. Uh, we know it's not a bar graph, right, a histogram. So it's uh, either positive or negative. And remember we said, look at the tail of the dog, okay, going toward the positive axis. And true or false? Under the current federal budget process, which statement is true about the president's budget? Uh, the president approves the budget request and after consultation with congressional leaders establishes an appropriate submission date. Uh, the president approves and budget must be submitted by February 1. The president and select congressional leaders approve and the budget must be submitted by the first Monday in February. Uh, the president approves and budget must be submitted by the first Monday in February. So you see there's a lot of them there that, uh, you know, can throw you, but go by, you know, which one, what we've been harping on all week when it's actually due, right? The last one. Okay, I think that's all. So um, that kind of gives you a feel for, you um, the different types of questions. So who, um, which one of you, who out there did the sample or, or signed on and got the sample questions? Did they look anything like that? That That's not inconsistent with what I saw on the website. Okay. So what they probably have done then is taken old test questions and put them together. And uh, that's what, probably makes that, you know, package up. Okay, uh, that's all I have. So Rich or Rodney, over, over to you. I don't I have anything else, Rodney, except thanks for everybody uh, for your attendance. I know it's been a long week and good luck to everybody on the exam. Yep. You got that's it yep. here. Hey, thank you guys so much. It's always a pleasure. I mean, really, really, I still don't know how you guys store that much knowledge uh, 
in your heads, but you know, every time I go through this class, I, I learn something new. So uh, thank you both, and, and we look forward to the next iteration. Um, Commander Ricker? Yeah, you know, I just echo uh, what Commander Noah said. Um, just so much information. Always love having you guys in to teach our classes and really appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Look Thank forward you, to seeing you in person. <laughs> yes, yes. Next time yes. I right. I am I am dealt I am not counting Delta Cron as anything, so <laughs> break the Delta Cron curse. <laughs> Thank you, thank guys. You, OK, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. All right, guys, we are not going to belabor your liberty. Uh, <laughs> this this week has been some kind of painful for some of you, some kind of daunting for some of you all. 